Welcome everybody to a special episode of the Hustle Sanctuary, live and direct here with my man Jeff Bass. Thank you for joining us, Thank you for having us. Uh, Jeff is a super accomplished producer, musician, writer, um, crucial in discovering Eminem and the early direction of uh, his career. A lot to dig into today, man. We're right here, live and direct from Detroit. It's my hometown. It's my hometown, I have all my studios are right down this road here. It's great. Detroit Live. We could start there. How cool has it been to see the city come back over the years? It's amazing. You know, there's a lot of good people out there that are helping the city come back. You know, I I think uh, this particular city, Ferndale, has made a huge turnaround. Because I've been coming here to these studios for uh, probably since the late 70s. Wow. Well, let's uh, let's throw it back and tell us a little bit about how you got started. Okay. I think that'd be good for people to know. All right, yeah. So um, when I was 19 years old, uh, actually when I was 16 years old, I had a R&B group. Okay. And from 16 to 19, we were in high school. Me and four other dudes that I had grown up with, we secured a record deal with Quest Records, which is Quincy Jones's label. Very nice. Got in touch with uh, a couple of guys that were management company and put us in the studio, let us you know, do some demos. Mm-hmm. And so we did some demos and we gave the demos to a fellow over at Warner Brothers. Fell in love with us. He sent that to a guy named Ed Eckstein, who was out in California. And Ed said, wow, they really have something good here. I think that Q should hear it. So they sent a the cassette tape because we were doing cassettes at that time. <laughs> and he sent a cassette tape to Quincy, who at the time was actually recording, I think it was the Bad Album with Michael. Mm. And um, You're 19, I mean, that's a huge moment. I'm 19 years that's old. A huge oh moment. yeah, I'm 19 years old. Uh, and right there, I guess, the story is that Michael listened to it too. Nice. And said, Q, you have to, you gotta sign those boys, they're pretty good. So he did. He signed us. We had two albums. One of the album got uh, one of the singles got up to 17 on the R&B chart. And you know, I thought I was a star. I was a star in my own family, basically. But through that experience, uh, which lasted about five years, okay. You know, I thought I was going to be a rock star, and that, that didn't really pan out the way, the way I wanted to. But it was it was a good experience what? getting in. And then from there, I realized that I really wanted to be behind the scenes mm. as a musician. Okay. So, you know, I, 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 like, I was listening to songs from Motown writers that were, to me, incredible. And the, the, the way that they put their chord progressions and, and it's just the, in the pop music at that time, pop R&B in early 80s, mm-hmm. It wasn't so fun for me. I started to get into more of what became hip hop, you know, and I wasn't a huge fan. Yeah. But I did. I got it. I understood what. What was the like first? Sugar Hill. Hill Sugar Hill game. Was that the first? I think that was 1979. Okay. So I was 18 years old. I mean, I've, you know, everybody knew the lyrics to that song. So that drew you into to the world of hip hop. Kind of. A little bit, you know, but I, I, I still, while I was doing my thing, I, I, I still wanted to make it more my own because I knew that back, even back then in the early, hip hop started off based on samples of other people's music, which is a great art form. But I felt I could do something different. So you're, you're working with Quincy though, I want to touch on that. Like, <coughs> yeah. Obviously a legendary dude. Oh uh, yeah, um, intimidating. <laughs> intimidating, I was going to say, what, what would you say is a standout moment just from working with Quincy? Um, I think it was his 60 something, his birthday. Okay, and we were invited to his birthday party Mm -hmm. and we had to play at his birthday. This in LA? This is LA. And we had to fly out to LA and perform for him at his birthday party. That's intimidating. That's intimidating, but that not just that, the Jacksons were there, Diana Ross was there, mm. Peggy Lipton was there, which was his wife at the time. I mean, like, these are people that, okay, like, <laughs> like I'm freaking out because, <laughs> like, oh, and 
the hot group at the time, R&B group, was Shalimar. Yep. And so what, the guitar player wanted to have a guitar duel with me on stage, and I'm, I'm, I'm going, oh, my first time to L.A., I, I'm very uncomfortable because all these stars are there, and I this don't know. This is the deep end. There's no, like... Yeah, you're going to either yeah, have yeah. to really play <laughs> your ass off and do something. And, yeah. And, but I got up on stage, and I did my thing, you know? <laughs> he put his guitar down. <laughs> it went like this, like, okay, you won. <laughs> you know, I'm like, ah, not bad for a, a Detroit Pishkala. I love it. So anyhow, um, that was very intimidating to, to mm. have to perform in front of Quincy Jones sitting there like this, you know? Yeah. So, so let's, yeah, let's kick it into the transition, man. So you know, the transition, after, um, after my deal was over, I think it was 1985, um, really didn't, I... Four, took four years off of really wow. doing nothing. I mean, I couldn't find myself. You like, were just I, figuring trying it out. To, I was figuring it out, figuring what I was trying to do, and I had a bunch of odd jobs. Mm. And How old were you just for uh, timeline purposes? Well, my son was born at, when I was 28 years old, mm -hmm. so it was 1989. So 28 to 32, right? Yeah. Okay. So here I am. Was that tough? I mean, you just oh, got yeah. off this deal with Quincy. Yeah, I mean, you know, and, you... The, and mentally it was tough because, yeah. you know, when I got the deal at 19, I'm yeah. thinking, this is it. This is, because me and my friends at that time, like, they were all, we were all talking, when I was 18, they were talking about what colleges is everyone going to. Uh, and me, I was like, I'm going to be a rock star. And they'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> right, rock star, right. And I'm like, no, honestly, I am. Because they were all going to state and Michigan and Central and wherever else. There's a quote on that, by the way, that I like. It says, you're, you're considered a fool until you're considered a genius. Have you heard that? Yes, I have. It's, <laughs> it's, so, like, tr it's, it's so true. It's so true. So while they were all doing their thing in life, I was like struggling. Yeah. To be honest with mm. you. 28, 29 years old, something like that. My brother had gotten into some trouble and uh, actually got hurt in a, in a fight and received some money in a lawsuit mm -hmm. and bought a little mixing board with that money. And we set up a little studio in my mother's basement. We're doing, I mean, as any musician, I think it starts off doing stuff for free, right? Absolutely. A lot of time. Can you tell me yeah, about yeah. your first paid project, like going back? Like, what was uh, the first time you actually made money off of your craft? I recorded an album mm -hmm. um, for a gospel group. I think I got paid $20,000 for the whole album. So I worked on it, worked on it, worked That's on great. it. That's great, yeah. Yeah, very first oh. paid project where I thought, oh my God, you know, I turned in an album and I got a check for 20 grand. Yeah. So, but with, um, you know, coming to the late 80s, um, I did a lot of work like that where I would do albums, mm -hmm. turn the albums in, get a little check. You know, but I had a kid. I had, my son was a baby when this first started happening, so I needed to make money. Yeah. So that's, but I used that time to hone my craft. And then through that, I actually met George Clinton and Parliament Funkadelic. You developed a relationship My brother there. was doing a lot of um, remixing and mixing his mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. And then of course, George was using me to play instruments, whatever instrument yeah, he yeah. wanted me to play. And I would just like be, go run to the studio, and knock out six guitar tracks and whatever it was. So I started getting around a lot of really cool musicians mm. too so and that helped me with my production of stuff because I could see how everybody how they perform in a studio how they perform live and your style evolved I imagine too right yeah so because I, I mean I, my whole thing was funk R&B and jazz yeah you know with a pop sensibility to it but that was the time right yeah, yeah it was yeah, the yeah, time so I, I went through a lot so. of musical changes in my life which I love them all so but I used all those tools for myself to create what I eventually called clap music. Clap music? Yeah. I've heard of trap music. I right. haven't heard of clap music. Right, I, ne I, never really made, us. I never really made it popular, but uh, essentially it's classical music, rap music, R&B. It's the fusion of huh. everything. But if you break down Eminem music, mm -hmm early Eminem music that I was working on, mm -hmm. uh, you take him out of the equation and you break down the tracks, yeah. you'll hear classical music. 
as a thread. And I'm like, what the fuck is that? Classical music. Like strings, too? Strings, like, yeah. the, the, the chord progressions of the piano. Yeah. And the different types of strings that would come in, crescendoing and doing all kinds of things. And no one even thinks about it because they're, you know, when you when you finish a song and you got your your track going and the rapper rapping on it, you're listening to the story he's telling you. But if you break it all down, it's like a classical piece of music. Mm. I was trying to get people to understand what that was. Maybe there's a lot of people doing it now. They don't even realize that what that's what exactly. Doing. Or yeah. they do know what it is now, but they don't necessarily call it clap. That was just one of my sh things that I I can explain to. Eminem or my brother of how to I like know, that. come up with a term so it'll stand alone from everything else that was happening. What's funny, I grew up on, my, my dad was a child prodigy pian pianist actually. He played with the Detroit Symphony Orchestra when nice. he was eight. Yeah. Eight? Was eight years old. Beautiful. I still have the uh, article from the news. But it's funny you say that because my first love after that was like hip hop. Like when I was like nine years old, I, I got drawn into hip hop. It's amazing. And so, yeah. So, so your it, classical background yeah, with, so I grew with up what on you loved. Exactly. So you saying but that. But you just, probably, were you a fan of Eminem in the early days? Yeah, of course. Yeah, okay, so course. you probably never I didn't even, realize why I was being drawn in. It was because it was familiar. If you break it down now, <laughs> at your age now, yeah. look back at the early Eminem stuff. You know, like on the um, Slim Shady LP even. Yeah. Because I did it back then. And if you take one of the songs that I did you can actually uh, musically hear, mm -hmm. like, just don't give a fuck. Okay, you know that song? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, if you really listen to what, what everything's doing, mm -hmm. and a lot of times I left stuff in at the end of the song. Yeah. Like when the song was in the fade out on the radio, let's just say, or whatever. But if you listen at the end yeah, of the actually, song, yeah, actually, yeah, it's kind of. You go, wait. Did I just hear like an orchestra? It's kind of symphonic happening? at the end of it, right? right. Yeah, even that's uh, all me writing and playing that stuff. But let's talk about you know this this really uh, fateful moment yeah. where where so, you and your brother got my, introduced to Eminem. Absolutely. So he was on an open mic night at or day whatever. I think it was in the daytime for uh, ninety six three, and he had called up to the radio station one of the DJs that were there, and he asked who 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 was that. Mm -hmm. And she says, some kid named Eminem. And this is off like a 30 second freestyle, freestyle. right? He just yeah, it may, over may the radio. A, yeah, it's 30, 60 seconds, something. Okay, right. Nothing, it's nothing crazy, but um, whatever it was, my brother heard that and said, oh my God, I've talked to this kid. So he gets in touch with him and Eminem and his posse at the time. Uh, which was D12, right? Which happened to be right. D12, <laughs> yeah. but didn't know that at mm -hmm. the time. Uh, it was Proof and, and all those Swifty in them, and they came into the studio. And my brother, like he was like, I know it. This is, this is crazy. He called me up. He says, "You got to see this kid. You got to hear him." So, the next day, I went there to hear what my brother was talking about. He was convinced this was the next big thing. I listened to it, and I was like, "Dude." You, you need to slow down because I'm not really understanding what you're saying. You said triple time, just you couldn't, Crazy. Un, you couldn't make... You know how rap God is, right? Yeah. Well, uh, it seemed even worse than that. I mean, it was... Basically, a, machine gun lyrics for those yeah. that don't know, right? And exactly. He was excited, though. I do understand that part, but yeah. that was also his style. I, t I said, all right, well, so we, my brother and I went over to our manager, this Joel Martin, and said, look, look listen to this. Mark thinks it's something. I think I don't know what it is. He didn't like it so much. But Mark brother was like, yeah, nah, we, we got to do something with it. So I was like, all right, well, we're partners. I, why fight it? So I brought him <laughs> into the studio. And from that point, we started working with him, letting him um, kind of find himself at the same time as us grooming what we thought he should be. And go more into that. What did, what was the vision that you guys saw? Okay, so the the vision, obviously, the first thing that I thought of was a white rapper. So who do, who do we all think of? Vanilla, Vanilla Ice, Ice at yeah. the time, right? Which uh, um, you want to do anything in your power to avoid. And I didn't want to come out like that. Mm -hmm. If I'm gonna like start getting into the hip hop world somehow, and you know, but I was listening. <laughs> This was really the first opportunity for a credible white rapper, I feel like, right? Exactly, but you didn't, you know, we didn't know. You weren't my brother aware knew. of that. Something time. in okay. my brother's yeah. head, he knew. Right. I don't know what it was, but, you know, and thank God, but yeah. he did feel something. Yeah. And I 
didn't feel something until halfway through the Infinite album. Which was the very first project? Very first project. Okay, okay. And, and then I saw how talented he, you know, I started to under, understand what it was mm -hmm. that he was doing. He created these stories on top of a cool track. Mm. You know, and I, I liked that. Like, like he started, he was saying something. So I would watch him almost like a psychologist would watch facial mm. expressions, body. So I would watch what was he bringing to the studio today? Like he was miserable. Mm. Well, I'm gonna have to create a piece of music that keeps him miserable today. I knew he was miserable or angry. So, and if he heard an angry track of music, he could he could actually express himself uh, through that music. Get those that emotions day. stirred up, so, right? And it, yeah. And, and it yeah. sounded like they fit like a glove. Mm. Like the, it's like they were meant for each other. You know, his lyrics on top of that music, plus the type of melodies that we would come up with for him to you know, sing and, and stuff like that, like choruses, hooks. Now that, that you're mentioning this, I feel like there, if I had to just like describe in one word how I felt after like an Eminem song, I felt like it was cathartic for him. Right. Yeah, so that's amazing. And so it was me, he was able to tell mm -hmm. ex and get it out. Yeah. Exactly the way he was feeling it on the inside. Yeah. And wow. so I was able to tap into that musically for him. Artists don't get that a lot of times. A lot of times artists just go, here, this is the song, do it this way. Yeah. But when you're collaborating like that. You're locked in like that. You're locked in yeah. like that, and you're like reading emotions and Where everything. magic happens, man. Right, yeah. and we, it seemed like we could do this whenever we wanted to do it. I just had to watch what he was doing. Wow. Watch how he was feeling. Watch how his day was going. What was one of the first songs, um, maybe, go towards like the Slim Shady EP. Uh, EP? Or, yeah, yeah, what was uh -huh. one song off there that was a really special song? Or Bonnie moment? and Clyde. Yeah, okay, yeah. Bonnie and Clyde. Right. Just the two of us. Yeah, just yeah. the two of us, right. Right, so a lot of that stuff on the EP mm -hmm. obviously were, was uh, samples on there. But he essentially, on the Bonnie and Clyde song, it's like where he... Kills uh, his wife. Kills his wife and he's driving with his daughter, he's explaining to his daughter Correct. what went down. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So she was, very, 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 very young at that time. Yeah. Like she couldn't even really speak English. Wow. She was like mama, dada. That's wow. how young she was. Wow. And we had her in the studio on 8 Mile in Detroit. As he was uh, recording Yeah, this. and we were recording her too. Like all the sound effects. Were really like, her? Yeah, I thought, all her. I thought... No, that was her. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah, and the, the crickets, all the, 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 the street noise. That's... We threw a microphone out on 8 Mile Road and started recording. That's amazing, man. Yeah. So Not like a lot we, of people would be nah, aware no of No one really yeah, knows yeah, that, yeah. but that's, yeah. we, we were doing the trunk sound, everything. You yeah. know, you can get sound effects, <laughs> like, but we, did, we went out there on 8 Mile at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning and just put a microphone out there. Got, so this way, when, when he got in the studio to rap, yeah. he felt all those sound Sounds, effects right there. Wow. It was amazing how we did that. I'm a, I'm a big believer in timing plays such a key role, obviously, in success, right? And, right. and uh, you know, with the boy band popularity with the NSYNC and the Backstreet Boys, all that was like at its height. Yeah. And here comes along Eminem, who's like the antithesis of all that. Correct. You can't script that, right? Which That's is why like, he yeah, was making crazy. fun of it back yeah, then. You we know? needed that. We needed that voice. We did because was... because you know uh, the fans out there were going, oh man, enough of this yeah. bubble gum. Which is the same thing I did years earlier with the Jacksons, the Osmonds, you know? Yeah. It's just, it's just, this is what happens, it just recycles. So I used to crack up when he would want to make fun of the Backstreet Boys in one of us, a song that, like, really? You're going to start? Because, yeah, it's funny. I'm like, yeah. okay. Because he really, that, he has. <laughs> would you try and talk him out of it? No. Well, okay. I just didn't understand it at first. Like, okay. like or we're in the middle of a song, and I'll say, you want me to, to stop the music? and come up with something else that goes with one of their things, but that he's gonna use totally different words and just give me the feel of what that was. And I'm like, oh, yeah. okay, I'll do that. Yeah. But I, at first I didn't understand why, and then when it all came together, I was like, that was pretty I genius. New kids on the block, block suck, suck a, a lot, lot of dick. dick. Boy, girl groups make me sick. Right. <laughs> and so I totally, I like, I totally yeah. played something that sounded like shit. Yeah, I remember that. And he was like, that's perfect. I want it to sound like shit. I'm like, oh. That's right. Okay, I get it. You know, yeah. and so his, he he was open to do. We were both open. Me as a producer, him as an artist, 
we were open to experiment with like crazy stuff like that. And I never wanted to tune his vocals ever when he sang. There was no auto tune or melody when, or none of that. Not, not when you were involved. No, yeah. not when I was involved. Later, <clears throat> later on, yes, but mm -hmm. but not when I was there. I'm like, you know, especially even like Kim. That song uh, was when when I wrote it. It was meant to have someone like Marilyn Manson or Ozzy Osbourne mm -hmm. sing the hook. So I said, "Em, go in there and just sing the hook, so that we have it on tape." And, we, then we can show Marilyn or whoever we're going to get on there what the part is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, nah, forget it. You sound great. It's out of tune. It's perfect. It sounds raw. And that was part of what his sound was. Early Eminem was mm -hmm. kind of raw. Yeah. He, what he was doing was raw. So why not your track sound raw too? You singing sounds raw because you're not a singer. You're a rapper. But he was able to pull that up and no one judged it like oh my god listen to his voice that yeah. sounds like shit no they were like wow that's how I sound when I'm in the shower I sound like that yeah. you know what I mean so yeah. people started to relate and it's cool to be able the to the raw emotion is what's most grabbing isn't it correct you know yeah. Okay. All right. So it starts off right. So you and your brother again. You know, Infinite, Slim Shady LP, and then obviously comes you know Dr. Dre, Interscope, Correct. like the whole thing. So yeah. walk us through that. So, so 1998. <clears throat> here we are. We fly out to California. Well, how did how did how did oh, they well, find out get, about it? Yeah. To, to get there first. Right. Uh, so M's traveling around in these uh, rap battles. Mm -hmm. He's killing everybody. We get out to California, and he's up against a kid named Juice. Mm -hmm. And Juice's uncle or something was the one promoting the gig. And at that time, all we, we had the uh, Slim Shady EP. EP. EP, right. Right, we had the EP. And he lost that battle. Eminem lost to Juice. He lost Juice. to Juice. Who I don't, I'd never, but it was I a never, little rigged, right? Cause, I think yeah, it was a little yeah. rigged, and you know, I didn't. I've never followed the kid's career, but right. I don't even know what happened. But I know that there was a kid in the audience in California mm. that fell in love with Eminem. Evan Bogart, which is the kid's name. That was that was who was at the show. That was at he was okay. at the show as just watching the show. Yeah. So and he and he couldn't believe that Eminem lost, huh. but. He did. He ended up losing, and he came to us. He says, "Do you guys have a CD or cassette?" You know, and we. You had, were there. My brother was. Your brother was. Yeah, there my brother was okay. there with with Marshall, and I think maybe a, a guy that they took that was like a bodyguard type sure. thing. But anyway, so they were there, and they said, "You got a, a CD I can have." Mm -hmm. So my brother said, "Yeah, sure. I got a bunch of CDs. You can." <laughs> so he gives him a CD, <laughs> and that's it. You know, that yeah. was the end of it. Next thing we know, that kid. Happened to work in the uh, mail department at Inter Interscope Records. But he didn't tell you that at the time. No, well, he didn't tell my brother that. My brother okay. knew nothing about him. Just a white, a white kid that liked a white rapper. Yeah. He didn't really mention who he was. Yeah. I mean, of course, he's and Neil. His, Neil his Bulger. father is a, a legend. <laughs> a legend. His mother Kiss is a legend. Kiss a little bit, right? His, yeah, her yeah. mother is a big time manager. Yeah. Kiss, Donna Summer. Yeah. You know, so I mean, he's pretty connected, but he was just a mailboy. Yeah. He was a young kid just doing his thing, and he took that. He was obviously looking for his break, too, as I, any yeah. A&R guy or Absolutely. mailroom guy Wanting to be is. an yeah, A&R guy. Yeah. And loved hip-hop mm -hmm. and saw that Jimmy Iveen was leaning towards hip-hop. Uh, a lot of people, hip-hop was... Tupac was already there prior to M. Correct. Death, and obviously Death, Death Row. Row was there Correct. prior so to Correct, so they, have yeah. a, they yeah. had a hip-hop presence. Yes. Along with great, yeah, they were actually the premier uh, hip hop Absolutely. label at the time. Absolutely, yeah, right. Okay. So he slid it in Jimmy's Friday listening bag <laughs> somehow, and Jimmy heard it and was like, "What the fuck is this?" You know, I listened to it. And the story is I, yeah. that he that you know he called Dre from that point and uh, said, uh, "You're got you need to work with this kid." And Dre's, I think at that time, was like, really, I'm going to work with a white rapper? Wait a second. I heard a rumor yeah. that when Dre heard the first demo of Eminem, he didn't know the guy was white. Is there any truth to that? Yeah, I don't, I didn't, I maybe, think he, maybe. no, there was truth, there was to, truth that. to that. Yeah, okay. because he, the, his flow didn't sound like your typical white rapper. Right. At that time. Right. You know, but wasn't sure he wanted to even work with him. 
And Be- because it was a white rapper? Yeah. Okay. Not that he had something against white people, or maybe he did. Who yeah. knows? His boss was white. No, but he just knew the deck was so stacked against Correct. white rappers. That's right. Yes. So what do you, yes. what's he up against? You know, <laughs> yeah. a vanilla ice thing again? Yeah. You know? Fuck. So Jimmy's like, no, you got to do it. You got to do it. Wow. You got to try. And so... Oh, and by the other way, Dre, there's there's two other white guys, involved. <laughs> two white Jewish dudes from uh, Detroit. So you have to deal with that too. Well, Dre had a, a label called Aftermath with Interscope. Did right. he have anything else signed at the time to his label? Do you know? Well, he had the Firm at one point. The Nas Project, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, which I don't think it was a flop, but it did I, okay. It did okay. Yeah. It wasn't monster. Yeah. yeah. Uh, at that time, who else was? I think one of the In Vogue girls were signed to him. Very quickly, Aftermath's project was Eminem. Very Again, a timing thing, right? Nothing else had absolutely. broke. You know, because it, if something else had really blown up at that time, maybe he wouldn't have, like... Correct. right. Jimmy might yeah. not have been so happy about right. it. You know, yeah, whatever. He's just, you know, whatever. I don't know what this is. And uh, so it was a good time. Plus, it was a good time for Universal because the merger just happened between uh, Seagram's. And- when that merger happened, Seagram's purchased Universal and Interscope Correct. and all labels underneath it, and they wanted M to change some of his lyrics. In the Slim Shady LP, because the content of his lyrics, as we all know, were very risque. Mm-hmm. You know, talked about you know, raping and all, and. Killing your mom Killing is pretty your, serious. Yeah, yeah. Not, <laughs> yeah. A, not a bad shit. Yeah. Doing tons of drugs and right. drinking and everything. So they wanted him to change the lyrics. We had delivered the album. We did everything that we were supposed to do. He, they wanted to change the lyrics. And he says to them, which goes to show you how brilliant he was at that time. He's like, listen, I will change the lyrics when you stop serving alcohol to kids. Well, how do you tell someone from Seagram's you know, to do that? They, I mean, they, they're not going to do that. So they dropped that. They said, go ahead and put out whatever you need to put out. That's incredible. And it blew up. I mm. think we sold, at the beginning, it was, we had sold like three million records in a short period of time. Mm. And obviously it was a hit. Struck a nerve in people's, you know, the, the fan base started to grow like immensely, you know. A lot have to do with Dre. A lot has to do with I mean, people- what we've developed him into Eminem, you know, his look, you know, having him dye his hair blonde and wear a wife beater. Now, whose idea, going back to that, we we talked about this, you know, Eminem struggled a little while, I think, for a sense of image, right? Sure. So the Slim Shady character. He actually came up with the Slim Shady character while he was sitting on the toilet. Prior to Interscope and everything like that, right? So you were around for that, right? Yeah. yeah. And was there like a phone call to you guys? Like, hey guys, I got it. Like, okay, can you walk us through that? Yeah. He he said, okay, I was taking a shit. And and I was thinking (laughs) like, how can I be a little bit different? Because we cannot, I mean, no one's accepting what I'm doing. Right. So, you know, and I'm like, "Ah, fuck do I know? I'm just trying to do what I got to do. I don't know. You know, what what else? He says, "Well, well, I was sitting on a toilet taking a shit. And came up with an alter ego. Slim Shady's my name. There started the direction of what he started to write about. Yeah, and then then he had it. That was that was the missing he, link, sort of, right? One of you the know. missing links. So yeah. he had that. Now his image, his look, mm-hmm. was a whole nother thing. And he just didn't look like a star mm. for some reason. So we were trying to figure out what the f- what 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 are we gonna do with his look? So we were at our studio in California. Uh, one of the girls that worked for us said, you know, I think you should dye your hair blonde. So he goes and he dyes his hair blonde. And we said, why don't you put a wife beater on, you know, like a tank, tank top, just a white one with the jeans and everything. Boom, there's, there's the look, you know, that, I mean, he looked like a, somebody now. He stood out. Wow. Was, I didn't see anybody that looked like that at that time. And I think to be a global superstar you need to have everything dialed in right absolutely it's not enough just to be a talented no, rapper no no that's you correct see, that's, yeah. a good, that's a good point because kids today don't see that yeah. he, he looked the part mm. he was he was slim shady when he had to be mm. it was no joke like he, he could be crazy it, on the real side of things it was you know he, he could turn it on and off like that 
you know, when he's not, when he's just his baby's daddy. Yeah. He's Marshall. Yeah. But when he goes to work, he's Slim Shady. And so now we got everything locked in. What, what was the moment in the timeline and all of this where you guys were like, oh shit, like this thing's really gonna go? Like, what I was think, that <laughs> um, so my, for, for me as the writer producer, uh, I remember telling my manager that really the only reason I'm doing this music business thing is because I love music. So, mm -hmm. I mean, an accolade for me would be a gold record on the wall. Mm -hmm. Definitely. For me. That, that was, uh, for a lot of people, yeah. Gold, yeah, but I mean, platinum, but you whatever. know, so for me, I, I didn't even know about platinum. I just knew gold. Okay. So I called him up one day because I know I kept reading the charts. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, hey, Joel, what's happening? When am I going to get my uh, gold record? You know, he was here in Detroit while I was in California. I lived there for the first four years of M's career. Joel, your manager, was in Detroit. Yeah, he was still here. But you and M were in LA. Yes, right. We were okay. in LA. Yeah. So I would call him and say, you know, when am I going to get this this gold record on my wall? Because I mean, that's <laughs> that's what I want. Yeah. You're not getting a gold record, he would say. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> You're getting a platinum record. I'm like, what's that? And he goes, that's a million sold. Oh, okay. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, I still had no idea what that meant yeah. other than, you know, okay, now it's not yellow, it's gonna be silver up there. Okay, <laughs> great. Didn't really know what else was happening in, in my career with Eminem. Uh, it was amazing. Like, mm. oh my God, just like a short period of time ago, we, yeah. we were in my basement or my studio on 8 Mile saying, okay, if this doesn't work now, well, what are we gonna do? Wow. Really? So this was like an all or nothing thing for kind of everybody yeah, involved because we have, at the time? Because, because he did Infinite, and even before Infinite, he was working with some boys on the uh, uh, east side of Detroit. So yeah. he had been still trying to do something, yeah. but no one, you know, no one really cared. But he was trying, yeah. and I was, have always been trying to, to get the big break. Right. You know, and then once you get that big break, how are you going to hold on to that? Exactly. Which is the hardest thing to do. Hardest thing to hold on to. Yeah. I feel like the hardest thing is getting that break too at times. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I didn't get my real break yeah. until I was 38. Mm. 38 years old, I had mm. a hip hop guy. But that's, that's what the Hustle Sanctuary is here for, man, is to talk about I love all it. the twists and turns. Right, so right, for all, all the people journey, out there man. that feel like they have to give up at some point because they gotta go make a living, or don't give up. Keep it going. Uh, try to find some balance between, you know, making a living to pay for your food and don't forget what you're shooting for. Money comes with success. So. It's a byproduct of, uh, the money is a byproduct of Absolute, the success. Absolutely. And the success is a byproduct of your love of music Correct. and your craft. Right, because you know? I, I mean, I was on food stamps and, and government cheese at the very beginning. I was gonna ask you, how rough yeah. did it get? For me, it got, it got really rough. I had a kid who, yeah. so at that time, 80, whatever it was, I can't, at 86, maybe 87, yeah. 88, right before I actually opened up a studio, you say how I opened the studio, but first of all, before 94, I was on food stamps mm. and government cheese for my kid. And you had a kid? I had a kid. It was a baby. Oh, man. So, and then you have to try to figure out, okay, I, you want more in life for your family, of right? Course. I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth, so I had to figure out how am I gonna do this on my mm. own. Never give up on mm. whatever your dream is. Whatever, it, whatever. You wanna no. be a lawyer at 50, go to back to school and become a lawyer. You know, it's never too late to do it. Yeah. yeah. Great message, and uh, it's, it's shocking to think, like, you know, you could have walked away, potentially, you know, after the Quincy deal went away, or what, you know. And, um, you know, who knows, man? A couple different twists and turns, the world may have not seen up. I don't know, you know? I think it's very that, possible. I think you guys played absolutely. such a pivotal role. It, I, you know? I believe that. Yeah. And, and, I know, and I know that the people that worked very close with us at that time, because mm -hmm. it, was, it was a really close-knit team. Yeah. We, me and my brother, we used to be called the FBB, Funky Bass Boys. Mm -hmm. And then when we realized that the Bass Boys can't do sh shit alone, we need a team of people. And you do. You need a crew. I'm not talking about a posse crew to go hang out and get drunk and whatever. I'm talking about a group of people that know their position in business. 
So my position and my brother's position in the business were creating the, the music, right? Mm -hmm. Then you have your artists who um, have to hold their end of the bargain. You, know, you have to create your music, your lyrics, and whatever it is, and you have to work well with these two guys, mm -hmm. okay? Then there's management, there's lawyers, there's accountants, there's that part of the business part. And then your family is another part that plays a big role in it. You know, you need the support of everybody. So if you have a whole, your whole crew is on the same page. Yeah. That's when the magic happens. That's when the magic yeah. happens. Yeah. And we talked about this when we met, but you know, that, that fun word, synergy, right? Yeah. There's something magical about right. synergy, right? It's true. And, uh, you know, I like reference, I mean, you can reference a million things, but you reference what Little Wayne and Drake did almost, that whole team, obviously. Right. Well, that Look was the happened. right synergy, yeah. Right. Uh, uh, and without Kanye, what would you have? Right. You, I mean, you had Kanye and Jay-Z and that camp, and that worked right. well. And um, I remember talking to a big executive at a, at a major label who, who turned down Kanye. You know, this person was like the final vote to turn his deal down at a major label. But in a way, she kind of helped set him up for that career by default, because had he gone to that label, we could have had a whole different result very easily. Absolutely. And uh, that's another thing I think for people to, to key into is just because a door closes, hey, that next door might make you 100 times more successful. Correct, right. So. And sometimes a certain label is not really good for your, uh, that, as someone can offer you a record deal yeah. Like, and you're all excited to get this record deal, but the record deal is a piece of shit. Right. And you just gotta, right. They'll, they'll sign you just to shelf you. They will. They will. You know, so you got to be careful. Absolutely. You're, you're better off doing it on your own. Try, you are. One fan at a time. Yeah. But, you, you know, um, a good lawyer can never hurt you. No. You, yeah. you, you need that. And, and, and the other magical word is leverage, obviously, today. Right. You know, it's, right. like, it's like build your brand, let that grow. And then but, when it comes to doing the deal. Yeah, I see, but that can also, like, you know, not for me, for, uh, for a producer in that situation, yeah. it could, it's, it's, it's hard at times, too, because I've met with, over the years, I've met with tons of label heads mm -hmm. and A&R guys and all, all kinds of stuff. And every time that I, you know, they, I get into the offices for meetings, mm -hmm. just like it's nothing. Yeah. But when I get in there and they're listening to what I've been doing, you know, this, I have this artist, I have this artist. Do you have anything like Eminem? So it's almost like you, you, they could, because he was such a phenomenon. Yeah. You know, no pun intended, yeah. phenomenon. <laughs> but uh, they're looking for that sound. Yeah. Different, different artists, it. but that sound. So, and they would say to me, and I can list specific people, but I'm not. But they would say to me, you know, that's that sounds really good. Do you have anything that's like Eminem? <laughs> Yo, I need yeah. something that feels yeah, the music like and sound is... sound like Eminem. You know, but not Eminem. And I'm like, yeah. uh, I already did that. I did that as a writer yeah. producer. Like yeah. I, I did, I. I did that sound. It's done. Yeah. The boy that did that sound is famous now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that sound was created for Marshall. Yeah. They, but they don't understand that sometimes. So the the label heads, they don't really understand that. Wait, you know that that was crafted like that. Mm -hmm. You know, and what Dre saw the vision that we were trying to do, and so he crafted what he was crafting, so it all fit together. Like when you listen to the um, any album that Dre and, and and our production was on, no one ever said, "Oh, that doesn't really go together." It was cra it was cohesive still, right? And you guys brought different styles. Exactly, yeah. we were able to. And I never heard his three songs on the first on that first album mm. until uh, they were they're almost mixed, ready to go on the album. It was the craziest thing. Wow. So, but. He heard ours. We heard a little bit of My Name Is. Mm -hmm. And I saw how things were going, uh, style-wise. Mm -hmm. And um, it worked perfect. Was there an initial meeting, though, I'm sure? You know, when you guys first got to meet with Dre, was there... Uh, bef oh, yeah. We, before the deal was actually yeah. done. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there was a meeting. How'd, that, me how'd at, that meeting go? Yeah, I'm just Well, we met, we met at Jimmy's office for the first time. Okay. 
And uh, just it was really just like introducing ourselves, blah, 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 blah small talk but shit. But the actual, like, let's have a sit down, you know, and get into it. Like, he, what was they, that meeting like? Um, interesting, because we went to dinner at some somebody's restaurant. I don't even know who, mm -hmm. whose restaurant it was, but all the stars were there. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of freaky mm -hmm. for us, because we just came from nothing. Yeah. And here we are out to dinner with, you know, I think. Was, was Jimmy there? Nope. Jimmy wasn't there. Okay. Dre, it was Dre. It was a bunch of his crew, you know, and just Tony Braxton was there, and there, which she thought she knew me, but she didn't. <laughs> um, uh, there was my, me, my brother M, a uh, uh, kid that we brought with us to L.A., and a few other people, and we sat at that table at the dinner table, and for four hours. Yeah talking about what the plan was. Exactly, that's... Oh, I think the uh, the a r guy for Interscope that they uh, they gave, oh. gave us at the time was there at the meeting. Okay. Which we ended up firing. But, uh, <laughs> um, and so we had dug into it that night. We were about like what we were gonna do, what he was gonna say. And I knew he was only doing three songs for the album. That means I had... At that meeting that was decided that he would only do three? A little bit before that meeting. Huh. When he took the project on. When he said we were, that Aftermath Interscope was going to do, so we were doing the short version of the contract. Right. And it was still in negotiations, details of it. Right. But that was, but we knew it was going down, so we were just going to, we're going to go to work. Sure. Start doing, because we had to create the, the album. So we knew that Dre was doing three songs. So then I was responsible for the other, the rest of the album. And, and let's talk about this. So you go on this incredible ride, obviously. It takes off pretty quickly, like you said. Yeah. Right. Once we once we got the deal signed, yeah, single and we did the 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 album, finished the album, yeah, and once it was released, it was fast. It just from that point, it right? Was very Obviously, fast. there was this crazy long build up and 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 right. food stamps and and no burger joints and no right, correct. And people just on the outside are like, oh yeah, that, this that this happened, and then it just took off. People don't realize the years, how much the years struggle before, right, and hustle went into oh, that. Yeah. Of course not. And but, tears and, and yeah. you're just like really yeah. So you it's know, important to highlight that obviously. It, yeah, absolutely. And, it wasn't an overnight success, right? Right. Even well, though actually, it looks like it. There's a, there's a saying called a 10-year overnight, a 10-year overnight success. Correct. There's a saying goes. You know, in our situation, it was like six years building up to... Just you guys and M, your brother and yeah, you and M. Yeah, just yeah, trying exactly. to find what works. So what did you notice, you know, as the fame started to like, you know, set in and get bigger and bigger, how did you notice M's demeanor, personality uh, shift? Yeah, yeah I'm curious. Um, after the third album, which was uh, the Eminem show, mm -hmm. so after the success of the third album, which was and for a the point monster, of reference, yeah, yes. there was I guess cleaning out my closet. Um, Superman, I think Superman, was yeah, was that. So. And the, the ironic thing is, I was and me as a writer producer was actually able to have singles on you know because I never really had singles in the early days on the first. Two, right? Right. Right. Yeah. Because you know that's business. You yeah. Know? Dre's the. I mean, Dre's. Dre's the, the label, so obviously. You know. Dre should have the yeah. single, right? I understood it. Right. I wasn't gonna quit because I didn't <laughs> have it, but you know, I had patience. Yeah. Because I knew that I could write a single, and then, and then uh, without me, Superman. All charted songs. Wait. Uh, yeah, that without me was massive. Yeah. Right. Because it'd be so empty without me. Right. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So right. I, mean, I finally was able to have songs that I created. There you go, right. And you know, they were becoming singles and sing for the moments. All I mean, it just kept on going. And that obviously proved that, wow. okay, well, I was just as worthy as anybody hey. else for the right singles. And they were big songs. That's amazing. And there's all these songs yeah. that, that um, were created that weren't necessarily singles. But people knew what they were. Like, and you go to an Eminem concert early days. Yeah, I was standing next to people that were humming the guitar line, humming the bass line, mm -hmm. humming the, a keyboard line that I pulled mm -hmm. out of my heart. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and to see 30, 40,000 people going, do, 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 and I'm like, wow, fucking awesome. Da, 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 da. Da, na, 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 and they yeah. all singing it. Yeah, it, fuck, it cracked me up, guys. That I mean, that's got to feel surreal. 
It, it really is surreal. Yeah. It's it's like the feeling I get, and here I, here I am all these years later. Mm -hmm. uh, you go to a Michigan football game the other day. What happens before the game starts? Dun, 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 <laughs> You got 100,000 fans screaming because Lose Yourself is playing. You know what that feeling is every year to have that? That's amazing. Just knowing that, wow, you gave, you gave the world something totally relatable. Left an indelible that's footprint a, That's on a legacy the world, right man. there. That's incredible, Great. Yeah. Whether it's with the lyrics or without the yeah. lyrics, that whole piece of music, yeah. that four, five and a half, five minute piece of music, people just gravitate to. That's pretty incredible. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, but that I like is, it. but that's what we did together. Oh. You know, and thank God you guys did. 